Christ, my Lord and Savior. He's your Lord and Savior. And just a few moments ago, um, Ron just felt stirred. He's like, I need to get baptized right now. And so let's, let's, uh, let's pray for Ron. Father, I am. <laughs> Hallelujah. You're freaking me out, Daddy. You're freaking me out. Oh. I never knew love could be this sweet. There's nothing like your presence, Lord. And there's nothing like experiencing it, Lord, in the lives of, of other people around. We just, we, we, we know you're here. You're here right now working in our hearts, building your kingdom, building your family. I'm so thankful. Father, I ask for your great blessing upon this man. He has made the choice to make you Lord and Savior of his life. He has chosen to be obedient to your Holy Spirit, moving upon him. Uh, these, this, is a, this is an awesome man right here. This is an awesome man who responds to your spirit. And Lord, I'm thankful for the lesson that you're teaching us through him right now. Lord, I ask that you would bless him. Grant him favor. Fill him with your spirit. And use him, Lord. Use him in a mighty way to build your kingdom. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You want to have a seat? Go all the way up. Crisscross. You ready to do this thing? I'm ready. All right. Well, as you all heard, he said Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of his life. Is there anything you want to say? We want to party with you. Amen. Amen. I want to praise God for everything He's done for me, and I want to show Him how much I really love and care for Him. Come on, brother. And and I just I just feel feel His presence right now. Not only does I'm cold because I'm sitting in the water, but I can feel His presence. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and awesome. It's, it's, that's that's it. Well, I don't know how long you're going to be around here with us, but Hopefully I'm going to speak for this family right here, right now, and we're going to love you and we're going to help you. I love you guys too. We're going to be here for you. Thank you guys you. with me? Be here for you? Thank you. All right. I want to remind you also that just because a doctor said you're not going to be here much longer, he ain't God. Just remember that, okay? Because of your confession, I now bury you with Christ. And like him, you'll be raised to new life because you trusted in the mighty power of God that raised Christ from the dead. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on. Oh, you're so welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know what's awesome? He has no change of clothes and no towel. That's what I'm talking about right there. That's what I'm talking about. Give it up. Awesome. Woo, I'm going to fall over. Incredible. Well, God is so good, and uh, his favor is upon our church, and it's just been amazing to watch and watch him work. I reminded you guys, I think it was last week or the week before, that the humble will see their God at work and be happy. And uh, I stand in awe of this God. And uh, just this, this past week, uh, just a, a quick testimony to the faithfulness of God as he promises some things and he delivers some things and it might not be a big deal to some of you but it was a big deal for me uh, a few weeks ago we received uh, these pews and and they were free and that was incredible right sixteen thousand dollars worth of pews donated to our church for free now here's the thing when when we when we went to pick up the pews along the back wall were these awesome green chairs and, and if you've been around here for a while, you know that we had the ugliest chairs in Lake County. Amen. And the most uncomfortable. And so, I'm, I, listen, I'm, I, I was lusting after those chairs, man. Like, I was sinning right there in their sanctuary. I wanted those chairs so bad. I'm like, how about them chairs, you know? Do you think maybe we get the chairs? He's like, pastor's like, no, 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 we're going to keep the chairs. I'm like, all right. 
keep the stinking chairs, whatever. So, um, so we get back here, eyeballing them ugly red chairs, and, and, and some of us were talking about the chairs. Seems to be a steady flow of conversation about our chairs over the years. And, and, and so I, I, just, I just felt like, you know what, God is going to, he's going to come through like he's come through like crazy and all this stuff in this place, right? So why would he stop with chairs? Why wouldn't he just deliver some chairs? So just to, I tell everyone that and they're, like, yeah, they're probably going, yeah, yeah whatever. Well, it's like a couple days ago, I get a text message from the pastor and he's over at Waterman Village and he says, hey, I just want to let you know that the CEO of Waterman Village decided he'd like to donate these chairs to your church. Yay. Boom. It was crazy, right? Never ending. So I'm excited about the chairs. How about you? But they're really, really comfortable. Are they comfortable? Don't fall asleep. Your preacher's right there. You better be good. So speaking about his preacher, um, extremely blessed tonight. Extremely blessed. The blessing continues. I have a dear friend. His name is John Abner, and he is the pastor of Victory Church over in Donna Vista. Now, if you don't know where Donna Vista is, you're in the majority. Donna Vista is a little spot between Eustace and Umatilla. Umatiller. And if you're going down 19, just before you get, well, just as you get out of Eustace and you go into Umatilla, there's a, a, a white church building on the right. And you'll see it's got the Victory logo on the front. And he is the pastor there. So I, I've had the opportunity to, to meet him and spend time with him. We've had coffee. You can't do ministry without coffee. Amen. And so, yeah, so we've got to hang out. Now I'm going to share some of you real quick, and then I'm going to bring him up to the pulpit. He's going to crack open God's word with you and, and, and bless you. But the thing that I really enjoy about John is his humility. There's two things. He's, he's, he's a very humble guy, and I'll tell you why I know that. Because he's, he went to a church 14, now 15 years ago, that church that he pastors now. And he stepped in and he started... Uh, youth ministry there and he humbly served under that pastor for 14 years now I've been in ministry for a while now and I've seen a lot of people venture off way too prematurely and get crushed because they think they can and I get it well he knew he couldn't and he like I said he humbly served that man for 14 years and I've listened to some of his stuff he's real good he definitely could have been preaching but he didn't, because he hadn't been released yet. It wasn't time. And so after that man retired, he stepped in, and he's now the senior pastor of the church that he was at. And the church, if I could sum up that church in one word, from where I can see it, is healthy. It's healthy, very healthy. And so I also know he's a tenacious studier of God's word. And so tonight he's going to take that humility. He humbles himself before God. And he's going to bring you a message from God's Word, led by God's Spirit. Amen? So welcome, John Abner. I love you. I'm also introverted. I don't know if Moses knows that. but I, I would much rather be hanging out with you at a coffee shop or something, or a bowling alley. In case there's any question, I beat Eric every time we, when we play. Oh. Um, trying to keep him humble. <laughs> uh, I would say that uh, I think Haley kind of already preached our sermon tonight. I mean, how I just sat there and cried at the purity of the moment and how good God is not only to her and her family but to you guys for having an opportunity to be a part of that and watch it uh, I would say don't ever take those moments and Ron praise God I mean he just gets up right in the middle and and it's so good um, and as I, I, I was crying because and, I, and I'm not like really emotional but I was crying because the church of yesteryear would corrupt her. Like everything that God is doing in her life and the, the freedom and the love and everything that she's experiencing, like, ah, man, I'm so glad I can just kind of be free with you. Um, my grandma's church would screw her up. And, and, and I'm sorry, grandma, but that is true because... 
I experienced it, not in my grandma's church, but I experienced it myself. Um, a little background, I, I was uh, raised in Cincinnati, Ohio by uh, a single mom, and uh, she is my hero, and she completely gave everything that she is to raise a knucklehead like me, and um, I, I had some freedoms that I shouldn't have had at a very early age because my mom was doing the best that she could with what she was given, and, um, and, and can I say that for, for parents in here maybe that are going through some situations with your kids and, and you don't really know where they are or what they're doing, or maybe they're estranged right now, can I just thank you for being the best you could be with what you had? And come on, yeah, it's worth, worth praising God for. And um, she did the best she could with what she had, and, 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 and I, I, I chased after everything that this world had to offer. I, I started drinking when I was 14 years old. I started doing drugs when I was 16 years old. Uh, by 20 years old, uh, I was addicted to cocaine, and, and that wasn't even the worst part about me. The worst part about me was like all the things that went on up here, and, and, I, and I'm so thankful that you can't see what goes on up here because it's not good. It is not still not pretty, but I was the least compassionate, most self-centered, most selfish person that I've ever met in my entire life to this very day. I'll tell you right now, I only cared about me. What I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it, when I wanted to do it, and I didn't care what it looked like. I didn't care who got hurt. I didn't care about anybody else except for me and, and mom, of course. But, but that was it. And I uh, was also a coward. And I got into some trouble in Cincinnati with some of the things that we were involved in. And, and, I, and I ran. And I, I had a friend in Kentucky uh, that I thought might bring me in. And so I called him and I asked him and he, he welcomed me into his home. And I went to Kentucky thinking I would escape the things that, that I was involved with in Cincinnati, but only to find out that, that like, there was nothing else to do in Kentucky <laughs> except to drink and get high and, so, and chase girls. And, so, uh, and, and they're better looking in the South. And so that was awesome. And... Uh, so I go and I fall right back into that same trap doing me what I do, how I want to do it, when I want to do it. And, and it just so happened uh, in my journey that I was at a high school soccer game, a place where I, I really had no place being. And this girl walks up behind me and uh, with this sweet southern accent and begins to talk and I, I turn around and, and remember like it's all about me and I'm super prideful and, 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 and cocky and, and I turn around and within like 15 seconds I said hey what, what are you doing tonight and I kid you not this girl looked me square in my eye I don't know how she turned this down but she looked me square in the eye and she said, I know, I'm, so, I'm, I'm, so, I'm not trying to make you out to be a liar. I am humble, I promise. <laughs> I, uh, I said, what are you doing tonight? And she said, nothing with you. <clears throat> See, what she thought was turning me down, I took as a challenge, right, guys? And so I decided I would find out where she worked, who she was, and like looking back, I'm so thankful that I didn't know this then, but I was stalking her, and so I found out where she worked, and I went down, and I, I asked her out again, and she gave me the same answer, and so I finally went to my friend, and I said, what in the world do I have to do for, for Kendra to, to just go out with me, and, and his response was, Kendra's not going to go out with you unless you go to church. I had been at weddings and funerals, man, weddings and funerals. As, so I didn't know anything about church. And so I said, you know what? No problem. Get in, get out, do my thing, make sure she knows I'm there. Go out with Kendra. Sounds like a great plan. And so I go to the Methodist Church in Russell Springs, Kentucky. And uh, uh, now, mind you, 21-year-old, uh, knucklehead, uh, blonde hair, black sideburns, gauged earrings, eyebrow piercing, tongue piercing, middle of Kentucky. You put it all together. And 
I go into the church and the pastor, I don't have any idea what he said that Sunday because all I wanted was for Kendra to know that I was there. And I'm pretty sure she didn't. <laughs> and so I left and I decided that day I'm going to go back one more time and, and see what happens. And I went back the next Sunday and it just so happened that the creator of all the world, the creator of the heavens and the earth loved me so much that he decided before I was born, before creation ever existed, that on this Sunday, the preacher was going to talk about a God in heaven that loved a knucklehead that was raised by a single mom that knew unconditional love better than anybody was going to talk about a father in heaven that loved me unconditionally. And I said, what? I know what that is. Like looking back now, the love that my father has compared to my mom, my, my mom's love is rubbish compared to his love. Knowing what I know now. But my thought was, if there's a father in heaven that loves me, then I can love him back. Because that's the only way that I know how to respond to love. Is if you love me, I love you. And so I said yes to him. And I, I did the whole deal. I went down to the altar. And I, I, I prayed with the pastor. And, 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 and everything was, was pretty good. I'm pretty sure. And I still got drunk that night, I think. Um, and, and so there was still a work to do in my life, and, 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 and it began a process, this journey that I, I'm still on, and, and believe me, I, I don't have anything figured out, but I know that he loves me. I know that to be a fact, and, and what happened was, was he was talking about all I had to do was say yes to him. It wasn't like, okay, uh, I need to say that he's Lord, because the reality is, is that Jesus is Lord whether I say he's Lord or not. He's Lord. You can't make him any less Lord. No school, no official, no principal, no, no, no president, no leader, nobody can take away his lordship. What we're called to do is say yes. I submit to you as, and I, I'm so thankful that you said, Lord and Savior. Like you don't get to say Savior today, Lord later. Like that's a lie and it's been preached in the church, but it's not true. He's Lord and Savior over our lives. And when we say yes to him as Lord, he comes in, he dwells inside of us, uh, uh, he forgives our sin, and now we have access to our Father in heaven. There was a separation that has existed since Genesis that because sin came in, we no longer had access to be able to walk and live and commune with our Creator. But when we say yes to Jesus, that gap is bridged and you don't just get heaven, and you don't just get your best life, and you don't just get blessings. All of those things are secondary consequences. The thing that you get is Father. You get access to your Creator. And I said yes to Him that day, and I've had access to Him ever since. And, and the preacher, he even told me, he said, John, he said, this is not done by any of your own merit. You don't bring anything to the table. Jesus did everything on your behalf. And when you say yes to him, it's done. And I said, yes. But then the church tried to screw me up. <laughs> because after I gave my life to him, I started to walk. Let me say this. this. This hit me when I was over here. You guys, you, you do not have to fight for the attention of your creator. I've got two little girls. One is two, one is seven. The two-year-old fights for my attention and her immaturity. The seven-year-old knows if I just wait, I'm going to get all the attention I need from daddy. You do not need to fight. There's nothing in you that needs to look or act or sound better than anybody else in order to get attention from your daddy. 
He loves you and his eyes are set upon you and his attention is given to you. There is this awesome scripture in the book of Exodus chapter 2. Uh, it's verse 25. It's not on the notes, so just bear with me. But in Exodus, the uh, uh, people of God are, are in slavery. They're in bondage. They're crying out. They don't know why they're in this situation that they're in. And it says at the very end of Exodus chapter 2 that God knew the Israelite or God heard, uh, saw the Israelites. And then the, the chapter ends by it saying this. And God knew. God knew. He knows you. He knows the fights that you're in. He knows the things. He knows that for some of you to be here, just tonight was a fight. He knows that, that come Monday, it's going to be a fight. He knows the struggles that you've been through. He knows all of the things that you have faced in your life. And hear me tonight, the things that you've been through, all they are is your license to minister. Because if you've made it through the fire and come out the other side, you've got something to offer to this world. Listen, I love to surround myself with former uh, uh, addicts, with felons, with people that have been through divorce, with people that have been through fights, people that have been through struggles, because I know about people that have been through struggles in their life when it gets hard again, and it will, they're not going to turn and run because they've already been through the fight and they've made it out the other side. One of my favorite sayings outside of the scripture is that master captains are not forged in smooth waters. Hear me, if I'm going out to sea, I want to be with someone that's been through a storm. Because, well, first of all, if you've never been a captain in a storm, you're due. <laughs> and I don't want to go out with you. you know? <laughs> but I want to know that you've been through a storm and you made it through the storm and you're still fighting another day. And for those of you that have been through a battle, that have been through a struggle, let me say this. God knows. He knows. He sees you and he loves you. And he's got an awesome plan for your life. And so, I married the girl, by the way. Praise Jesus. We've been married. We'll be married 15 years in December. Um, she's way out of my league. Like, I was a youth pastor for 10 years, and here's my theological advice for young people. You find a, a girl that's willing to marry you that's out of your league, do it right then. <laughs> like, don't wait. Just do it right now before she changes her mind, right? And so and that's what I did, and um, we moved down to Florida shortly after getting, we got married December 15th of 2001. We were living in Florida December 29th of 2001. Uh, through a course of events, I found myself at, at Victory, and, and, and praise God, I, I've been serving uh, there ever since. But um, I get there, and uh, uh, some things happen, and uh, the pastor asked me to, 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 to do something, to say something on a, on a particular Sunday, and I did. And, and, and I didn't screw up so bad that he didn't invite me back, so I got to do it again. And I got to do it again. And about three or four weeks in, uh, this sweet lady came up to me with a, a newspaper article, and she handed it to me. And, and I thought that, you know, this must be something that's just, like, really beneficial. It must be really encouraging. You know, she, she hears what I'm saying. Like, she must, she must be really happy that I'm here. And so I take the article, and I thank her for it. I hug her, and I put it in my pocket. And I get home later that afternoon, and it was an entire article written as to why I should tuck in my shirt. Like that was the pro that was a problem with her, that I didn't have my sh and I was I was I was wearing khakis and a dress shirt back then, I was like doing everything I could to be what they thought I needed to be. Praise God, I don't anymore. I'm working towards preaching barefoot. Like that's my goal right now, is I want to preach barefoot. And so I kick them off right now. Well, all right, well let's just do it right now. So, so. Like, this is fulfilling a goal of mine right now. You don't have any idea how big of a deal this is. Praise Jesus. Like, it feels good. I'm so comfortable now. Now I can preach. Uh, and so I read it, and I'm, I'm heartbroken. I'm young. I'm in my early, mid-20s, and, 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 I, and I, I'm not good enough. I've got to do something. I've got to change. In order to be good enough to, to, to seek God and to serve him, clearly I need to start tucking my shirt in. 
And, and then it was, well, you need to, to read this or you need to do that. And, and all along what was happening was that uh, in my sinful nature, I was creating this like legalistic mindset that said, yes, he paid the full price, but now that I'm his, I've got to earn my way to him. And it exists and it shouldn't because it's a, a lie from the pit of hell. It couldn't be any farther from the truth. And, and then what I found out later, man, I feel so good being barefoot. This is awesome. <laughs> oh. What I found out later was that I wasn't the only one that was dealing and, and struggling with this, that even back around 50 AD when Paul was writing to the church in Galatia, they were dealing with the same thing. So let me read this to you, Galatians 1. And, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me. And this is where it gets good. He says, to the churches of Galatia. And so he, he makes it very clear that this is for everybody. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself up for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and you're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, let him be accursed. For I am now seeking uh, the approval of man or of God. Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And let me say this. I was, I was on my way here tonight, and, and I was singing about just an honor to be here with you and, and to, to serve alongside Moses. And, and, and I've known him for many, many years now. And the one thing that reigns true about that man is that he loves God. He loves God, and he loves God more than anything else in this world. And and, and there's going to come times in your life when you love God more than anything or anyone where it's going to cost you. And it's going to feel like it's causing you trouble, but I promise that when you hang in there, that the blessing is coming, and he's going to use that love and that passion for lives to be changed. And I'm just so blessed to be with you uh, tonight. And so he says, uh, if I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me, it's not man's gospel. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently, and I tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my father. But when he who had set me apart before I was even born called me by his grace, and was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult anyone, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia, and I returned again to Damascus. And so Paul is making this very clear as he's writing this letter. I'm writing to everybody in Galatia, everybody in the church. And I love the way that it starts, grace and peace. It's a very similar way that Revelation starts out. We make Revelation to be this book that is scary and frightening. In the, the first four verses, he says, blessings, grace, and peace. The writers of the scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit make it very clear that uh, you will know truth. And truth doesn't bind you. Truth doesn't make you feel inadequate. Truth doesn't make you feel like you're not good enough. But truth sets you free is what it says. And when you hear truth, you might not like it. It might be uncomfortable. But every time you hear truth from the word of God, it will set you free in your life if you will receive it. And so Paul says grace and peace to you guys. And, and he's making it very clear that it's to everybody because there was a group of people that were amongst the church uh, in Galatia that were known as Judaizers. Uh, Judaizers were false teachers that were saying, say yes to Jesus, but 
you need to make sure you follow all the Jewish rules too. And so they were saying, yes, but yeah, you got to do all these things too. You got to add to it. You got to trust in Christ and do all of these other things. And so the gospel is spreading throughout the region. It is going, it's advancing. Uh, Gentiles were coming to faith in Christ Jesus. And as they were, these Jewish leaders, they were trying to bind them up with these Jewish customs and these Jewish rules. And what happens is, is that all the church leaders, they get together and they decide, we need to talk about this. We need to have a discussion about what is going on. And this is what they say uh, in the book of Acts. You could turn there, just go to the left, uh, just a little bit, Acts chapter 15. I just want you to read verses 8 through 11. This is what happens when the church leaders get together to decide, is it Jesus plus anything? This is what they say. God knows the heart. He bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are we putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. He says, look, it's grace and grace alone that we are saved. Why are we putting a yoke upon these Gentiles that our fathers and our father's fathers were never able to bear? That's what I was referencing, and, and I'm not trying to be like insulting or derogatory, but, but that's what I was addressing when I said that my grandma's church, my father's father's church, when I said yes to Jesus, tried to immediately, I just stepped out of bondage. I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I just step out of that bondage and I say yes to Jesus and the church is all of a sudden like, whoop, hold up. Like we want you to be bound. We want you to be tied up into this thing. You need to look the part. You need to sound the part. And if you don't do X, Y, and Z, then you're not good enough to go into the presence of God. And I immediately got bound up in this thing. We all have a tendency, every single one of us, church or no church, we all have a tendency to add to the gospel. And when we do, we undercut the foundation of our salvation. And even today, 15 years in, 16 years almost uh, since I gave my life to the Lord, I constantly have to pull myself away from this idea that says I can affect the love that Jesus has for me. Let me just say this. There's nothing you can do to make Jesus love you any more than he does right now. Stop trying, church. Stop trying. And I would say this. There's nothing that you've ever done to make him love you any less. Stop worrying. Stop allowing that thing to bind you up. Like, people might not like you. Good. Like, the, the less that people like me, the easier my life gets. Like, like I, I, we, we have, we have a, a, a situation in the family. My family puts the, the word fun and dysfunctional. And uh, we recently had a situation, and, and all it did was drive me closer to my wife and my kids. Like, praise Jesus, that's done. You know? And so, but we get so bound up and, and we worry about these things and there's nothing, nothing that you can do to make him like, you cannot earn or shout loud enough or dance big and, 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 and bold enough in order to capture his attention any more than he has of you. And it's really good news for me because I, me, from Cincinnati, Ohio, am the most awkward, introverted, clumsy, white kid I've ever met in my life. Listen, I mess up slow dancing at the high school dance. I am so awkward. And, and I don't like big gatherings of people. I just kind of go off to myself, and, and I'm called to, like, to, to speak. Thank you, God, for your sense of humor, right? And so... Uh, uh, and, and the church uh, makes fun of me, my faith family makes fun of me because um, I can't even clap on time during the songs. I learned a trick watching the snare drum. Praise God for drummers that help me do that. But I have to be sitting behind somebody that's clapping so that I, and I even mess them up. I had a guy who felt bad for me one time. 
I had a guy who felt bad for me one time. Good, good man. He's no longer with us, but uh, he said his name was Tom, and he came up to me. He said, uh, he said, John, he said, it's actually harder to clap off beat than it is on beat. He said, so you have a gift. I'm like, Tom, I love you. You know, he's a liar, but I, I love him. <laughs> and so, but it doesn't matter. I'm free to be me because I'm created exactly the way that the creator wanted me to be. And in all of my awkwardness, I'm free to just be that. And if I want to jump, I jump. And if I want to clap, I clap. And if I want to sit, I sit. And I don't do it without any kind of worry that someone might think I'm less holy or less righteous or or less in love with my creator. Because I'm exactly who he called me and created me to be. And so this is what we do. We come to a service. We're sitting having a conversation with somebody. And we say yes to Jesus. And maybe we say a prayer. Maybe we just, it's like one of those moments like Saul, our eyes are open to the need of a Savior. We say yes to him. But then immediately we begin to figure out, okay, what do I do? Right? I guarantee that 99% of you, if you're saved, and let me just say this, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, right now is a very good time. He loves you. He paid a price for you. And you're created to walk with your Father in heaven. And all you have to do is take a moment and just say, yes, Jesus. It's done. It feels too good to be true. But it's not. He paid a price to make it that easy. It's not free. It cost him everything. But he loves you. And so I'm in a church, right? The preacher says, Father in heaven has unconditional love for you. My attention is tweaked. I say yes. Musicians come back up. He says something, takes some scripture completely out of context and says, you know, uh, if, if uh, the scripture says that, that if, if you uh, deny your, your uh, Jesus in front of others, he's going to deny you in front of your father. If you confess him in front of others, he's going to confess you in front of others. And so confess him now in front of this group of people. And so I felt guilty. I felt, conf- you know, that I needed to do that. And so I came out and, and I came down as if that person down at the, at the altar had a salvation to give me because it was done the moment the eyes were opened. I was saved. And so I came down and I said yes. And it probably helped, you know, because Kendra definitely had to see me then. And so, <laughs> and so I came down and then service was over and I went up to the pastor. He's a good man. His name is Jim Kingry. He's who uh, actually married Kendra and I. And I walked up to him and I said, what do I do now? And he did. He gave me like this little thing. You need to read this and you need to, you need to start talking to your father. We call it prayer. And I said, okay. And he said, uh, and, and you need to be nice. And I'm like, ah, oh, you okay? I could probably do that. And you know, you need to start coming and, 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 and worshiping here with us. And what did he just do? Not intentionally, but he just inadvertently said, Jesus is everything. Accept him. And I said, yes. And then he said, now do all of these things in order to keep him. And I did. I tried. When the reality is, is all I needed to know was at that moment was that, John, Jesus now lives inside of you. Colossians 1. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In all of that self-centered life that you used to live, John, because you were the center of your universe, Jesus is now the center. Do whatever he leads you to do. Seek him. Remind yourself that he lives inside of you. And he's going to take care of the rest. I mean, he paid a price for you. He's going to lead you. You see, one of the things that I've learned over the years is that I make a really lousy Holy Spirit. Like, it's not my job to convince anybody to do anything. And and hear me, one of the most freeing things that I've really gotten lately is it's not my job to fix people. Praise God. I'm not here to fix you. I'm here to hang out with you. And that is so much cooler. And so let's don't look at people as projects. And when they're not saved, we're going to spend a lot of time with them. And then when they are saved, we're going to kind of let them go off and do their thing and hope they make it. Like, let's just do life with people and abide with each other. 
And let's let God that lives in us take care of the rest. And so I did. I heard him and I said, okay, you know, I'm going to start coming and I'm going to really try to be nice and I'll start reading the Bible. The only problem is, the only problem for me is uh, uh, I don't read very well. I barely graduated high school. No college, no seminary. I, and, and I can read, but w- even worse than my reading is I don't remember anything. If you guys could see my notes, <laughs> like they're not bullet points. <laughs> this is like word for word. <laughs> Because I can't remember. I don't retain anything. And so I went and, and uh, praise God for Kendra and thank God that like, I had grace for her because she, I was 21 years old, but she bought me a teenage Bible and I wasn't offended because she could tell, right? Like you're a little bit slower than most 21 year olds. And so, and again, and this is just how good God is. I started to read. I think she felt sorry for me, and she started reading the Bible to me. I didn't know that faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word. I had no idea, but I know who knew. (laughs) I know who knew how he created me, Exodus 2.25. Oh, you're finally stepping in the fullness of of who you're supposed to be. I'm going to send you somebody to read the Word to you because I know you can't read it very well. And so I started to force myself to read it. And I can't just read it once. I have to read it twice and three times and four times and five times. And then all of a sudden, things start to jump off the pages. And because I'm not very smart, I get to repeat it back in a way that makes sense. Because it has to be simple for me or I'm never going to get it. And so what ended it up being my greatest weakness ended up being my greatest strength that God is now using in my life. And so I tried to go through the plan. I tried to do all of those things. I tried to add rules to just Jesus. And hear me, let me say this too. This is really important. Um, I'm not talking about like accepting Jesus and then just doing whatever you want to do. Following his commands is called being a Christian. <laughs> okay? And so that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is that God's pleasure in you is not based on your performance for him. And that's so freeing. That's so exciting. And so Paul is addressing this adamantly with the church in Galatia. And, and, and we still have to address it today. And I just want to give you two things kind of quickly here. Number one, the gospel is free. It is free. This is what he says, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. To the church of Galatia, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. He gave himself. So accept this grace, this unmerited, uh, uh, undeserved favor from your Creator that is given to you. Accept this peace that's given. Paul uses those terms grace and peace like a hundred times in his writings in the New Testament. He wants people to understand That we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. That his love and our salvation has nothing to do with what I brought to the table. Praise God. I I laugh at things that I see. Um, Tax collectors, we we give them a hard time in in the New Testament. Like basically a tax collector, and I might screw this up, forgive me if I do, but basically a tax collector... They were given a land that they were supposed to, to take care of, and they had a certain amount of money that they had to bring in from that group of people. And anything that they brought in over that, that was theirs to keep. Does that sound about right? And so people hated them because they were crooks. Because they would take all of this money for themselves, and, and, and they were able, allowed to keep it. I think it's funny that God decided to have a tax collector write the first book of the New Testament. Like, slip them in in the middle, right? Like, hide them in there somewhere. No, number one, tax collector. Everybody hates him. That's good news for me, and it's probably good news for you. 
Because God uses us not based on who we are or what anybody thinks about us. He initiated our salvation. It says there in Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, it says, According to the will of our God and Father, our salvation, and the fact for those of you that have said yes to him, it is completely dependent upon him seeking after you. And if you're here tonight, and you again, and you haven't accepted him, you're here because God is seeking you. Because he's pursuing after you. He goes on to say in Galatians verses uh, chapter 1 verse 13 to 16, he says, you heard of my former life. I persecuted the church. I violently tried to destroy it. I was zealous for the traditions of my father. But when he who set me apart called me by his grace and revealed his son to me, then I might preach among the Gentiles. That's what we see in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus. Paul, blind. God seeking after him. Scales falling from his eyes. And all he sees is Jesus. The same God that sought Paul is the same God that seeks after you. He's the one that it says in Ephesians chapter 1 that chose us before the foundation of the world. Not one of us are here because God, because we were seeking God. Every single one of us are in this building here tonight because mercy came a running. How good is that? He sought after us. Not one of us were seeking him. Not one of us are here because we're so cool that we were really pursuing after him. God has pursued after you before the foundations of the earth. He had a plan for you. And hear me, beloved, I know it doesn't always feel like a good God is pursuing after you. I know that there's times when this world does everything it can to destroy you. But I promise you, he loves you and he's got a plan for it. And if you will fight and endure another day and trust in him, there's going to come a day. You know what I love about God is he's a finisher. You know what he said on the the cross, Jesus? He said, it is finished. You know what God says about you? He says, I'm going to see in the completion the work that I began in you. And he's going to do that in your life. Don't quit. That's what I love about doubting Thomas, right? Like You guys know that's not his name. The Bible never wants labels. Like his first name's doubting, his last name's Thomas. No. But he's still there, right? He doubted, he had questions. But he's like, where else am I going to go? He's still there. And what does Jesus do? Passes through locked doors and walls to get to him to prove himself faithful. You know what God is going to do in your life? He's going to pass through the walls that have been built around your hearts because of all the hurt and prove himself faithful. I promise you. See, I refuse to forget the ditch that pulled me out of. And if he pulled me out, he could pull you out. And he can pull out that loved one that you're praying for and you're crying for. As you're crying out, God hears your cries. And you know what God says about that? I know. I know. Just wait. Just wait. You see, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, he's not concerned with present circumstances because he's already living in a place where that son or that daughter or that brother or that loved one is already seeking God. Remember Lazarus, if you guys are going to clap for God, clap. Come on, give me get a good clap. Lazarus is dead and the Bible says Jesus hung out for two days because he's already at the place where Lazarus is alive. He's not worried about those present circumstances. <laughs> we get so like uh, worked up over politics. You know, one of the things you'll never hear God say, I didn't see that coming. (laughs) He's sovereign over this moment. And you don't have to vote for the one that's going to do the least damage. You need to trust in Jesus. He is going to see on the completion the work that he began. And if that means that we live in a post-Christian nation, and that means that we have to suffer persecution, you know what that means? Is that all of the superficial Christians are going to run away, and you don't have to deal with them no more. (laughs) 
So you got the Judaizers. They're saying, yes, Jesus, but all these other things too. And they're completely undercutting the authority and the power of what was done on behalf of these people. Um, and you say, well, what's, what's it hurt? What's it hurt to add some rules? Imagine if I had like a pure cup of, of drinking water and, and I dropped one drop of poison into it. And I said to you, Eric, it's mostly pure drinking water. <laughs> he would be a fool to drink it. So quit drinking the Kool-Aid that, that, that you've been being fed for all of these years. You don't have to earn it. It's done. It is finished. It is there. Just accept it and abide in it and walk in the freedom that is there because of it. Because the gospel says that your acceptance by God is based solely on Christ's performance for you. That means it doesn't matter how many times you prayed this week. It doesn't matter how many times you read the Bible this week. It doesn't matter how many people you shared Jesus with this week. You are still free to come into this house and worship him with everything that you are, even if you completely screwed it up. I'm going to tell you a funny story. I screw it up more than I get it right, I think. I'm pretty sure I do. So I go to the jail. It's one of my favorite things. It's, I'm pretty sure it's what God created me to do. I might get thrown in jail one day because I, I got really, well, when I had daughters, you know, I decided that if God ever wanted me to have a prison ministry, it might be through one, like from the inside out, you know, like some guy looks at them wrong and I'm in prison and, and I've got ministry in prison and I'm okay with that. But I go to jail on Thursdays and, um, the chaplain of the jail, he's been gone for several weeks because uh, his wife is battling some sickness. And um, all of a sudden, it's like, it's really hard to get in the jail. I've been going to the jail every single week for four years. And all of a sudden, I'm having a really hard time going in the jail. And so last week, I was going to visit an inmate, and I didn't go in my normal way. I wanted to go in as a visitor, sit behind the glass, and talk to this inmate. And I walk up, and the little poor lady behind the glass, she said, um, you have your ID? I said, yes. I gave her my ID. She said, uh, it's not visiting hours for that inmate. I said, I know. I'm a pastor. She said, okay, do you have proof? I said, yes, I do. I pulled out uh, a little card that has my name, the logo. Could have printed it up that morning, but whatever. I gave it to her, and she said, uh, she said, excuse me, sir, you need a third form of ID. I said, no, I don't. And she said, yeah, you do. This paper right here. She had a little piece of paper. She said, this paper says that you need to have a third form of ID. I said, I said, my picture is in the book upstairs. Just call them. She said, well, sir, we're not upstairs. I said, I know. That's what you got that phone for. Just call. <laughs> she's not here. Is she? Okay. I don't think she's here. I said, just call them. And uh, she said, sir, you have to get a third form of ID. Like, go get like a bulletin or something from your church that has your name on it. I said, we don't have bulletins. She said, well, I'm sorry, sir. The paper says you have to have. And, and she handed me the paper. I said, I don't want the paper. She said, no, you need to take the paper because it says, I said, ma'am, I don't want the paper. She said, take the paper, sir. I took the paper and I crumpled it up and I threw it in the garbage. She said, sir, you're rude. I said, I know, but I really want to get in and see this inmate. And so praise Jesus in all of his mercy. I get in and um, I go down and I see the inmate and I was a jerk, man. I was such a jerk. All she was doing was trying to follow the rules, and I messed it up. And so I got, went back up, and I apologized, and I'm pretty sure she did not accept my apology. <laughs> but the good news is, is I still get to worship him that night, and I still get to worship him on that Sunday, even though I completely jacked up that opportunity, because my worshiping him and my access to him doesn't have anything to do with how well I did has everything to do with how well he did. And that's good news for all of us. And so through grace, we're freed to live the way that we were created to live. Shirt untucked, barefoot feet, might say some things I shouldn't say, might do some things. Paul did. He said, things I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I do. But Jesus loves me. 
wrote two thirds of the book. <laughs> you know, he loves you, and and so there's got to be a reason why. Like like that's just the way the scripture works. If if something happens, if there's something there, there's got to be a reason. So what's the why? Why is your position with God not based on what you do? Why does God have a plan for me even though I'm a knucklehead, even though I'm a screw-up, even though I can barely read? Why does God have that plan for my life? Here's why. Galatians 1 verse 15. When he who set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me. Why? Why, Paul? In order that I might preach him. The reason that God loves you and the reason that he's forgiven you and the reason it doesn't have anything to do with you is because he's got an awesome plan through your life and your testimony to share him with the world. And hear me, this is my least favorite not revolution, but the platform is my least favorite place to minister the gospel. I'm an electrician by trade. I so miss the job site. I tell you right now, I don't minister the gospel near as effectively right here as I do jerking Romex in some house. Nearly as effectively as I do in Starbucks. Nearly as effective as I do in the jail. That's where the message is preached out in this world that you live in. God has a word and a testimony that he's placed upon your heart and those that are in your circle, those that are in your sphere of influence, those people that you work with, the people at the places that you shop, they ought to be changed and worshiping right here alongside you because God saved you, called you, shed his grace upon you in order that you might preach. Not him, you might preach throughout Leesburg in this community. Paul is saved. His grace is showered upon Paul for a reason, so that he would preach the grace of the Lord to the world. Worship team, let me get you guys back up here. I want to share one more thing. This is not on the notes either. I'll I'll move for you guys. You guys come up here because you are way better than I am. I'm going to come over here. So, uh, as Moses said, I was a youth pastor for 10 years, and uh, last June, I had the honor of being installed as the lead pastor of Victory. And uh, this is what I know one year in. I am way thinner skinned than I thought I was. (laughs) Because every day somebody's mad at me. Every day somebody doesn't like something that I said. Every day somebody is you're wanting us to do some different program or do something else. And, and every day somebody's, I'm, I'm not going to worship with you anymore. I'm going to go worship over here as if that's the way that it works. Like there's a bunch of miniature kingdoms and, and that's not what Jesus died for. He died for the kingdom and that's why I'm so thankful to be here with you guys tonight. But... Uh, And so this is what God has shown me over this last year, and this is what I want to leave you guys with tonight. Uh, Jesus is in the wilderness, right? Forty days is being uh, tempted by Satan. And uh, Satan comes to him and he says, All right, Jesus, uh, if you are who you say you are, I want you to uh, turn this stone into a loaf of bread. Jesus combats that with the book of Deuteronomy. Like, we're all screwed if our spiritual warfare is based on our memorization of the book of Deuteronomy. And then Satan says, okay, I'm going to take you to the center of town up on the highest pinnacle of the temple. I'm going to throw you off. Angels are going to save you. Jesus quotes another scripture out of Deuteronomy. Satan says, okay, I'm going to take you up onto this highest mountain. I'm going to show you all the kingdoms of the land. Jesus quotes another scripture out of Deuteronomy. And basically, this is what Satan was saying to Jesus, and this is what Satan does to me, and this is what Satan does to you. He says, Jesus, turn that uh, stone into bread. Find your identity in what you're able to do. 
And that doesn't work. He takes them up, and there's a big crowd of people. He says, throw yourself off here. Let them see you be saved by the angels. Find your identity in what people say about you. And when that doesn't work, he takes them up to the mountain. He says, I'll give you all of these kingdoms, all of this land. Find your identity in what you have. And as long as we're finding our identity in what we can do and what people say about us and what we have, we will consistently live this roller coaster of a lifestyle. Because I'm only 37, but I already can't do the things that I used to be able to do. If my identity is wrapped up in high school football star, which I didn't play high school, I don't run. I would have been the kicker, maybe. No offense to any kickers. But how many kids do you know they get out of high school and they're the man? And then all of a sudden they lose their identity. Or how many of you have had, but you've had not? How many of you, people like you on Monday, but they can't stand you on Tuesday? But this is why it didn't phase Jesus. Matthew chapter 3. Because just before Jesus went into the wilderness to fast 40 days and 40 nights, and just before Satan tried to uh, have Jesus' identity wrapped up in what he has, what he can do, and what people says about him, the Father spoke to Jesus after he was baptized, and he said, this is your identity. This is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased. Hear me, I don't care what you can do. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you have. And I really don't care what people say about you. When you put your trust in him, your identity becomes, this is my beloved child. And you need to remind yourself every day when those struggles come with who you are, that above anything that this world says, you're a beloved son. You're a beloved daughter. Beloved son, beloved daughter, beloved son. That is who you are. And because of that, we're free to be exactly who he created us to be. And we're free to worship him exactly how we want to worship him. And we're free to live exactly the way that the God that lives inside of you leads you to live. You, church, are beloved children of God. Don't corrupt Haley. Don't let the church or the world corrupt you. That is who you are. Embrace it and walk in it. Let's worship him, man. He's so good. Come on, let's just worship him. We're going to sing nothing more, but instead of filling this place because he's already here, we don't need to sing about that. Instead, let's sing, let's sing this as a prayer for him to fill our lives. Fill my life with your hope.